Hi there, and uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in, for listening, for watching. Uh, this is Thinking Out Loud. It's my platform here at saltwire.com, my opportunity to explore some of the topics that are in the news. I like to say to look beyond the headlines, to dig a little deeper, to perhaps give some context, perhaps uh, a perspective that you don't have. And there's no question, we've been talking a lot about healthcare and in this province for good reason. And it's a challenge right across this country. And the opportunity I have now to speak with someone has a great deal of expertise in the field. In fact, uh, she is the uh, professor within the Department of Political Science, but she is also the chair. And uh, just looking at some of uh, her research topics, uh, healthcare politics, healthcare governance, uh, comparative health policy, Canadian political thought. And I, I really do uh, value the time of all of our guests. And uh, Catherine, and I believe it's Furlback, Catherine Furlback. That's correct. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, let's uh, just go back about a week. You were uh, a witness at the Nova Scotia Standing Committee or the Public Committee on Health and not your first, clearly won't be your last appearance. What can you tell me about the tone of what the politicians are saying right now about this action to, quote unquote, fix health care? So the attempt to fix health care is um, multifaceted, it's multidimensional, and it depends on a lot of temporal thinking. Um, and in terms of the immediate crisis response, um, it's a lot like wartime medicine, right? Everything is deployed to the front lines, it's go, 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 it's let's do it, let's do it now, let's throw money at this. Um, and of course, that's a particular response that is an immediate political response, but also a policy response. That's what we elect our leaders to do. Uh, in terms of a policy response, you know, immediate crisis responses are not always the best things in the long term, but people want something, they want it now, so something has to be done. Um, but it, you have uh, better, you're freeing up resources to meet emergency demand, but what happens? Electoral surgeries, uh, elective surgeries are cancelled. You have a form of system triage, right? But the problem is that the healthcare system is so integrated, it's not just about emergency care. Everything in politics moved to where is moved to where the political pressures are, right? And if it is people dying in emergency wards, that's where the response is going to go. Let's move stuff to emergency. Well, at what cost? I know people whose, uh, again, elective surgeries are cancelled. Um, and you know, you're pulling things out of the system and that's not being covered in the media. But the problem with the emergency uh, system is not really the emergency system, right? It's the problem is that the paucity of long-term care and home-term care options, which keeps people in hospitals, maybe what, 30% of the people in the hospital shouldn't really be there, but we've got nowhere to put them. Um, so we have uh, a problem with long-term care, which prevents the hospital from working efficiently. And then we have the issue, of, as you know, with primary care. Um, so people are going to the hospitals rather than uh, to community clinics or to, um, you know, primary care providers because they don't have any primary care providers. And again, that's going to clog up here. So the, the emergency wards are ground zero for a system not working well, but it's really not the hospitals themselves which are the issue per se, even though there are um, numerous problems with different aspects of, of hospital care. But it's a much wider system response. And, and obviously we have elections and there's an electoral cycle. And then we have the bigger picture, the long-term vision, the short-term acute issues. And, and I'm wondering as a political science professor, as someone who's intersection with healthcare and health policy, do you see that the policies take that into account? Are, are policies strong enough to survive elections and perhaps the reaction politicians have to the immediate crisis? Oh, right. So that's such a big question because mm -hmm. you know health policy uh, health care eats up maybe 40 percent of our budget maybe more probably more these days so you know it's a huge ticket uh, item and it's going to get a lot of political attention so healthcare investment requires 
big ticket costs, right? Uh, so it started with hospitals. And interestingly, when we built the hospitals, a lot of hospital building in the 40s and the 50s up into the early 60s, that was done with federal money. You had the national health grants coming uh, after the Second World War. So the Fed stepped in and thought, well, you know, let's war's over. Let's look at national capacity. Well, it's not really that good. The provinces don't have a lot of tax capacity. We're going to step in. We're going to help the provinces. This is well before any form of Medicare existed. So the initial infrastructure was done uh, with a lot of federal funding. Um, and when Medicare came into being, it was explicitly done with the exclusion of infrastructure costs. So now we have all the crumbling infrastructure um, all the hospitals that were built in the 40s and the 50s um, and now you've got these huge ticket costs well politics the the, the larger ideological uh, um, environment over the past few decades was all about deficits and debt reduction and that's the, the primary focus here and you know there's a logic to that it wasn't uh, necessarily wrong in and of itself. Um, there's probably a little bit too much emphasis, not enough balance, but you know, money is finite. And you know, as people's parents say, ah, oh, it doesn't grow on trees. So we do have to keep an eye on the, on the fiscal situation. But again, it was a very intense focus on uh, debts and deficits. And of course, you know, it looks bad if you're a government and debt is the metric on how you are judged and how you are measured. So we have had election campaigns um, provincially, federally, probably municipally, where it all comes down to how well you've balanced the budget, right? Are you a profligate spender? Can you be efficient? Can you manage budgets? And if that's what your metric is, then that's how you're going to be judged. So if you have big ticket items, you know, what is the logical response for any provincial government? Push it down the road, right? Why commit to a huge expenditure if you're based on how well you balance a budget? Why give your opponents political ammunition? It's not rational. And here's why you have the popularity of P3 models, right? Because essentially it distributes costs in the short term. It sort of pushes them down the road a bit and distributes them off to them. So it, it, it looks better on paper. Um, but the problem now is that, you know, we've got almost a perpetual focus on brush fires, most provincial governments. Um, and so you don't really have the time or you don't have the, the capacity, the, the, the warm bodies to sit down and really take the time to try to take a deep breath and, and plot out what we should be doing and how we're going to do it. And some provinces are actually worse off than others. Um, and Nova Scotia doesn't have a huge planning capacity, especially if you compare it to something like um, Ontario. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ontario has ISIS, which is the Institute of Clinical Evaluation Services. They've got policy experts, they've got economists, um, and they can sort of disassociate themselves from the day-to-day -day crises and try to think through how things ought to be done and the different options that we have. Um, we don't have that capacity, um, so we tend a little bit more to really just lurch from, from crisis to crisis. Hmm. I, I'm not sure if you were uh, in Nova Scotia in the late 90s when, when Donald Down had introduced this plan for the Liberal Party, like a $500 million health care investment fund, and it was supposed to help address some of the short-term issues that were happening with the federal government under Paul Martin, mm -hmm. uh, or Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin, trying to shore up the budgets and trying to get that federal fiscal house in order, and the Liberals lost, and the Conservatives came into power, and we saw a proliferate a proliferation of uh, p3 projects so here we have this idea that you know federal money provincial money someone who says oh no this is how we can shore up the future you know by by the standards of the day uh that was not politically popular enough to win a party the government but yet if you look back in time you know it probably would have at least helped some of what we're experiencing today but that's why I, that's i guess where i was going with it, trying to figure out how you have the political side of it and the public spending part of it and then someone looking at it and going it's not working and we need to do something not today or, or specifically today but into the future medium short medium and long-term planning you are you seeing any of that 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 brings you comfort 
Well, you know, it's a bit of a mugs game to try to predict what's going to happen and what we're going to need 25 years in the future, right? I mean, that's part of the problem in that, you know, we have to plan for the future, but we don't know what the future is going to be like. And we know that technology is going to change, but we don't know how it's going to change. So, you know, um, look at Nova Scotia depopulation, right? I mean, who would have predicted such a population boom that we're having now? I certainly didn't. When I wrote my book on the Nova Scotian healthcare system, I was looking at the at all the uh, demographic uh, trends, which is just going down, 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 maybe a bit of a blip when there's a downturn in the oil economy in, in Alberta and people come home. But it, it, essentially, there was an assumption that, um, you know, the Nova Scotia population is just going to get a little bit more sparse every year. And and that didn't happen. Um, so, of course, if you're thinking that we're probably going to be facing long-term depopulation, well, it doesn't make sense to invest in large hospitals, right? Um, it makes sense to do smaller scale things to, to, to plan for a population that is contracting. So that's the first issue. We just, we have to you know, we have to plan, we should be planning, but we don't know exactly what it is that we're planning for, and we can be wrong. Um, but then, of course, there are the political choices, right? And the political choices, very important topic, they're, they're, cyc they're cyclical. Let's start from the 90s. And again, the 90s, uh, the 90s and, and, and onwards, uh, you know, there was this huge contraction in the in 1995, 1996. And, you know, the federal structure makes things so much more difficult because what happened in that instance was that the Fed said, oh, we have to get our house in order. Um, well, let's turn off the taps. Let's sort of, you know, slow the spending down to the provinces going, the provinces going, well, hold on a second here. We still have the bills coming in. And Ottawa goes, well, that's your problem, guys, which is why there is this huge acrimonious federal provincial war that led to the, the um, uh, health accord of 2003 and the 10-year plan so you know we're repeating that and we have to learn the lessons in the past most people have forgotten about the dynamics and it might be useful to look at that mm -hmm. but so from the mid-1990s onwards you know the focus is on debt and debt management and that was just a flavor of the day so McNeil comes in especially and that's his focus and you know I'm not f faulting him for looking this direction again i think good economic management makes sense um remember that mcneil went after the first thing he did when he got in do you remember what he did mm -hmm. he went after the public sector right, right? okay yeah. starting with the pcws i took him on and you know all these and um after that it was the nurses remember he took on the nurses then he took on the doctors and you know so it was cut back cut back limit um, moderate these the public sector is just too expensive we can't afford them their demands are too high um, and you know that the emphasis was, was on keeping public spending down and every time if you recall every time McNeil took on another uh, part of the public sector what happened to his polling ratings right they went up his popularity right. went up um, and um, I remember it could have been when McNeil came in, there was an electoral campaign and which campaign was it now? And so I think it might've been Gary Burl, who was, I think a lot of his campaign was on long-term care homes. Right. It was yeah, saying, that. we've yeah. got to do something with long-term care. We've got to do something with long-term care. And, you know, we as the electorate have to take some responsibility here for what's going on. We just went, ah, oh, old people, not interested. Old people, expensive old people, really not interested here right so we could have done something and if the so it's not the government the government just responds to what the people want right. and the people the people were obviously saying well let's you know get public spending down um so we all have some responsibility here i think i thought it was interesting uh, in that part of your appearance at the public accounts was you know we either have to pay now or pay a whole lot more later, which I think speaks to what you're describing here. Is it's it's very challenging to try to predict the future, and if if you're blowing, if your political uh, promises are blowing in the wind with how the last promise went with folks, then you keep heading down that path. Uh, I think I heard one economist say, "Well, you know, when the the provincial government decided not to go forward with the and it's off topic a little bit, but uh, the the art gallery saying, well, inflation, it's too much money.'" And the comment was, but it won't be any cheaper. 
So you're you're making a judgment by choosing not to go forward with that because it inflation is inflation. So to your to your point, and perhaps you want to expand on that a little bit. You know what you were trying to get through to the politicians in that context about you either pay now or you pay a whole lot more later. Right. So health health and health care are inherently political. Every time I hear, well, we have to take the politics out of health care. It just makes me grind my teeth. Um, and it's not because it's all about who gets what and how they get it and why they get it. And, you know, part of the health puzzle are what we call social determinants of health or non-medical determinants of health. So what we know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that um, income and education and housing are all integral in how healthy you are. So the more money you make, the more uh, the, the more years of education you have, the better, uh, the, the nicer a house you live in. Um, so the higher up the ladder, the healthier you are, right? So the thinking in public health and health promotion is that, well, you know, it's expensive to treat really sick people. We know that. Um, and again, you know, 5% of the population eats up two thirds of our healthcare costs. So the sick people are, are really sick and the really sick people cost us an awful lot. So can we just try not try to make sure that they don't become too sick so that they don't cost us a lot? Um, so what you do is you improve the upstream causal variables, right? You, you make sure that they don't get that sick. You make sure that, you know, they, they do have a job, that they do have an income, that they do have a roof over their head, that they do have adequate nutrition, uh, that they you know, get um, information on, you know, how things work and what they should be doing. And, and you, I hate to use the word empower, but that's a, a, you know, a good you know, short form way of trying to say that if you can facilitate the ability of people to look after themselves, then you can make it easier on the system. But again, a few problems here. And one problem, of course, is the temporal aspect, right? So, you know, it, if you keep people uh, in their 20s healthy now, then it'll cost the system a lot less when they're in their 60s. Well, that's 40 years down the road. Right. Who gives a frig what happens 40 years from now? That's the first problem, right? I'm, you know, I have to pay my taxes this year. I uh, don't give it to all these 20 year olds who, you know, won't be around when I'm, or when they're getting ill, then I won't be around. So why should I worry about it, right? So there's a temporal aspect here. Um, but, but it gets a bit murkier, a bit more difficult because in order to address these social determinants of health, there's redistribution and that's inherently political, right? So um, if we want to look at housing, if we want to look at quality of life, if we want to, to look at more, um, uh, if you want to facilitate people's education, you have to provide the money for it. You have to provide the funds. And that is, that is people's, uh, that comes out of people's pocketbooks. Like that's their tax money. So there's a lot of resistance to economic redistribution. And it's not just an economic calculation, but, you know, we have issues of moral desert entering into this, right? So, you know, even if it costs more, I'm not going to allow my tax money to be given to these people um, because they don't deserve something for nothing. Just look at these people. They're sitting around the campfire. They're taking drugs. They're, they're drinking. Why the heck should I give my tax money um, to let them to, to, to facilitate their way of life? So there is, and you can say, well, you know, if you do provide for this group um, through your tax money, it's actually going to cost everybody less down the road. So it's a good investment just from a cost benefit calculation. But there's still this sense that yes, but they don't deserve it. So even if it costs me more down the road, I, that's what I'm going to do because it, so there's this whole aspect of moral desert that plays a role. So this, um, I think Pierre Polyev had a video about, you know, the, the same idea of, uh, 
I, I think it was um, uh, safe injection sites right, right. in Brit- right. British Columbia. And there's so much literature that says, well, you know, economically, it, it makes sense in terms yeah. of mortality, morbidity indicators. It, it, it makes sense. But his point was that they really don't deserve it. And that was, you know, a very evocative response. So, so you do have these long term strategies and we do know that there is a correlation. We do know that, you know, that again, the, the wealthier you are, the better your health is, the less of a burden on the system you are. But we'll be damned if we're going to, um, you know, alleviate the burden of those who don't really deserve it. So it's a very difficult, very intricate, very almost acrimonious political debate to have. And it's it's, you know, it's it's a hard nut to crack so we know what the causal factors are but it's just the political calculation of how you can get people on side which is the the, the huge issue here and and i know it's uh, not perhaps a, an easy fix i know it's not something that i can ask you what's the answer and have something that is a, a concise way of trying to sum up a very complicated system a rubik's crew rubik's cube i think it was described as but I, I didn't ask you personally, as a professor with the overlapping interests and knowledge, how it feels for you to see what's happening, to see the patterns repeating themselves, and that you've written about it, you've spoken to this, you've appeared to before government committees, and yet it, it doesn't sound like people are listening, or maybe not the right people are listening. So how does that feel for you? How do you keep going? Well, it would be, you know, like asking me, um, you know, what sort of uh, um, environmental policy ought to be implied in what I think of carbon capture. And I'd just be, well, free. I don't know. It's, you know, so I can't, I'm very judicious about expecting people to, to understand all the, the root causes of what's going on. I, I, I wouldn't want to be put in the same place. And, you know, different different people in different areas have it, it, it the, the metaphor of course is the elephant you know the, the blind people in the elephant where you can you can tell one aspect of the of the creature but you're not aware of all the different aspects of the creature and you know f- i've got the luxury of looking down from thirty thousand feet and, and at feet and seeing how all these different systemic uh, problems fit together or don't but i'm not going to be critical of those who really think that the issue is this that or the other um, I mean, so for example, we, we could look at, you have a discussion about causality. What what are the cost pressures on the system, right? Well, there's, phew, I could probably give you about 10 or 12 different things, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's the fact that we have better treatments, that there's more opportunity. I mean, think about this robotic surgical technology that has been in the news recently. That's wonderful, right? Um, but these things cost more. We've got more drugs. We've got lots more drugs, and they're also getting uh, increasingly expensive. So, um, you know, the, the, we can do more, but the costs are really going up. And we have to understand this. And again, it gets back into political choices. Just because these things exist doesn't mean that we can afford them, and we can't expect to to to, to be able to accommodate everything the way we're doing it right now. So. You know, just throwing out a few stats. In, in 2012, for example, the average treatment costs for the top 10 patented drugs was about $7,000, right? the average per person, average treatment cost. A decade later, it's about $21,000, right? So right. drug costs have tripled in the past decade, um, which, which is great. We can treat more things. I mean, not all drugs are, are good. Only about maybe 2 or 4% drugs actually have a real new benefit to them but you know we, we are getting them through the system um and in fact you know drug costs are going to shoot up even more you know with with new gene therapies average treatment costs per, per patients per patient are going to be in the millions of dollars and you know the pharma companies know how to exploit the public to get these drugs covered you know all you have to do is go through the patient advocate group that you're funding find a, a, a you know um a cute little girl holding a kitten and take a picture of them, give it to the media, which is very gullible and very susceptible about these things, and then say, well, your government's not covering this drug. You know, don't you care about this girl? And of course, your public goes, oh, government, well, how come you're not covering the drug costs? And, and of course, the political pressure goes on. So, okay, we're going to cover this drug cost. Oh, it costs you know, $800,000 per treatment. But oh, well, you know, it'll get us reelected. We don't want to look like we're the bad 
the bad guy here, so we're going to cover this right, and so on and so forth. So there's, you know, the, the, the relationship with pharmaceutical companies and that the cost of new drugs coming in the pipeline is a huge, I don't want to say that, you know, we're going to fall off a cliff, but this is something that's, you know, really uh, building up steam. We're going to have to be aware of this. And there's demographics, right? there's more people, there's more older people, older people have more conditions, Older people need more time. Doctors are changing. They're younger, they're female, they have spouses that don't sit at home and look after them and put the dinner on the table for them and look after the kids. And you know, doctors want to work a normal week like the rest of us. Um, they don't want to have to deal with 5,000 patients in their catchment area. You know, um, They want more time per patient. They, they have more administration. I don't know about you, but I have all these frigging platforms that I have to deal with on a daily basis. And if the doctors have even half of what I have to deal with, my heart goes out to them because it is a huge administrative burden to try to do all the administrative work. There's uh, the structure of healthcare provision. Again, we're putting everything through the hospitals instead of through long-term care, through primary care. Law, you know, again, historical reasons for that. There's geography. You know, Canada has these huge geographical areas. Um, so there's all sorts of pressures that are sort of, you know, swirling together. And I don't want to use the metaphor of a perfect storm, but you know, all these things are settling together and solidifying. And and you know, it's it's not as if we can deal with one thing and solve that thing, and then move on to the next thing, and then solve that thing. That's not how it works. Right? Everything is interconnected, and everything is politically volatile. And then there's the, the temporal aspect. Some things can't be solved, you know, in the long term. We have to go to the short term, but there's reasons that we don't want to invest in the long term. So it's, you know, it's it's not as if we can just just solve the damn problem, right? Just get those federal and provincial ministers in the room and tell them to solve the problem and don't come out of the room. To, I mean, no, <laughs> it'd be nice, but it, it really doesn't work that way. You've certainly given, given me a lot to think about, and I certainly have um, a great deal of respect for the work that you're doing, and I want to thank you for, for sharing some of your thoughts today. I know you're a very busy person, and Professor, I, I, I guarantee you um, I've, I've learned and I've it's opened my eyes to other questions that need to be asked, so thank you for that. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Sean. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Catherine Frohlbach. She is uh, a professor in the Department of Political Science at Dalhousie University, and she is also the chair. Thank you.